Hey, everybody. Welcome to part three of our fascinating interview with Peter Joseph, who wrote this book, The New Human Rights Movement, Reinventing the Economy to End Depression. It's a fascinating book. You make points about the charity giving from billionaires, and it's really interesting about they don't want their tax dollars to go to the government, but they're so like there's this there's these billionaires. I met one of them. And they have this, I forget the name of the project, but they're going to give away half of their wealth or, or something like, do you know about this? Supposedly, right? right? And Are you referring to the, the, the old uh, billionaire pack? Yes. Pack that, Talk uh, about that. Uh, what, what was the name of it? Um, I can't, I'm, yeah, I'm blinking about that in a while. But yeah, so Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, a bunch of billionaires got together and it was a response to Occupy Wall Street, by the way. It's just a big PR move. Yes. They said, oh, we're going to set up this fund and everyone's going to make an agreement to give half, if not more, of their wealth to charity when they die. And we want to, and this is their poetry, and that's all it is, because but, because no one's really done it. And, no even if they, and if they do, they do it to their own private foundations. That's it. So Bill Gates, he's like, I gave away all my money. No, he didn't. He started the foundation and dumped his money inside of it with numerous tax loopholes to benefit off of. Not to say that he doesn't mean well, but it's part of an elitist narcissism that these people actually think they're more important in their views. They can influence countries. They can change the health care like the Gates Foundation in some country without any democratic presence at all. Right. That is totalitarian philanthropy. And that's just wrong. That's it. That's it. So they, these billionaires, they don't want uh, democracy no. in their philanthropy. And that's why they keep money out of the government. They, they move it offshore. Why... They do everything to keep it in the pocket of their little crew. Because they're, you know, they're always libertarian. Like people like yes. you know, Peter, Peter Thiel. Have you heard of this guy? Yeah. The founder. Oh, my God. He's the poster child of just everything ideologically wrong with the way. He's the one that started the idea of seasteading. Have you heard of this thing? No. <laughs> this is great. He wanted to, he talked about this years ago. He wants to build artificial islands off the coast in international waters because there's no law. And he wants to create a, basically an Ayn Rand utopia where you can have your libertarian values. Mm. There's no government. Everyone's just going to be trading and it's going to be a utopian um. market system. Absolutely unbelievable when I read about that. I couldn't believe how delusional you could possibly become. Um, only if you're a billionaire you could you do that, obviously. Right. Like if it's a whole island of billionaires, that's great. But if you set in motion, I'll say this, if you set in motion on an island, the mechanics of this system in and of itself with no regulation, no government, it would self-destruct in a matter of moments because you can't have a warfare system without regulation. There's got to be something without it self-destructing. In other words, warfare meaning you, the market externalities of this system, not to change the subject, but I want to, I'm on this, I want to just bring this up. What this system does is create externalities in the form of poverty, in the form of war, in the form of insurgencies, in the form of terrorism, it, of course, in the form of pollution and climate change. All of these things are things that the system can't account for. So it just dismisses them into the ether as things that aren't related. And when people argue for the system, you know, the pro-libertarian folks, they always think that those things are anomalous. Oh, it's the state government that messed up the free market. And now we have poverty. It's the state government that's not doing their job right. And so now we have pollution. No. The, the, the government exists in a, in a middle ground between the, trying to organize and stop the anarchy of this system of self-interest and competition, and it's also a tool of differential advantage for the most privileged of the, of the business class. Point B on the Koch brothers. Koch brothers are right there influencing government as you would expect them to be, while at the same time there are people like Bernie Sanders that are trying their best to stop this kind of behavior. And that's the dynamic. And who's going to win? Who's going to win in that circumstance? And the money's going to win. Yeah. So I always I joke. I say, well, you know what? If you have a whole society based on money, self-interest, profit, you know what? The Koch brothers should own and run America. Right. That would be consistent with our policy as a philosophy in general in this in this country and the world. So why do we why do we object? It's just hypocrisy in my mind when people don't see that. You know. Yeah. I, I just I want to stay one more just one more yeah. moment on this charity idea. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh. There's a real so that to me seems like a real nefarious reason why these billionaires like Bill Gates um, w want to uh, have control over their own charity functions with their money. Right. Instead of having to pay uh, uh, a reasonable amount in taxes mm -hmm. and then have democracy distribute that money where it's needed in society. Yep. They know they don't want that. They don't no. want a democracy to decide where their money goes. They want, just like they do in their own corporations, you know, Richard Wolf talks about this, Professor Wolf, democracy at work. There is no democracy at work where you spend most of your life. Good point. You're, you're in a totalitarian system, which yeah. is what a corporation is, mm -hmm. right? It's a top-down totalitarian system. There's no democracy. You don't, you're not voting to, to who's going to be on the board. The, the people with the money 
yeah. uh, do. So when they do their, so in, instead of when uh, they don't take their money and do charity like, hey, we're going to go solve homelessness, which Jeff Bezos could do like that. Yeah. Jeff Bezos is worth around $120 billion. It would cost $20 billion to end homelessness in the United States, yet he doesn't do it. It would cost $30 billion to, to end world hunger. To end extreme poverty, yeah. Yeah. If you could end world hunger with throw, he could end world hunger and homelessness in the United States and still have about $70 billion left over, which would still make him one of the richest guys in the world, yep. yet he doesn't do it. Nope. And to me, that's because people like Jeff Bezos are megalomaniacs, and that's a real thing. Well, you, you know the statistic regarding people of high business power are almost, not always, but a very high percentage of them are psychopaths. Yes. By the very, very definition of how what it takes for them to get to where they are, the type of gaming mentality and indifference, they actually have medical psychopathology. Yes. And that's that's well-established statistic. People should look that. I mean, I mean, I mean, just go back to the values of the president and the corporate concept. He, he approaches his work as a president like he's a CEO of the yes. country. And that shouldn't be a surprise. But I, one thing I will say, remember uh, Thomas Piketty, he wrote that yes. great book, Cap, uh, Capitalist, Capital in the 21st Century, and he criticizes you know, the wealth inequality. And Bill Gates made a big article in rebuttal to it. And what does he say? He goes, you shouldn't lump me in with those people that just buy a bunch of yachts. I, I, I want to use my money for good. And he implies that it's his right to make the decisions for mm -hmm. the world effectively in an undemocratic way that's right. to do that. And that's, uh, that is definitely a sick state of mind. So what, what people like uh, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos end up doing is they don't go end homelessness or give money directly to help. They'll go, I'm going to fund a law school for women. Yeah. And I'm going to, you know, that's the kind of stuff... They do, and 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 it's and we don't get to decide how we need the money used. So that's really an interesting. Uh, uh, people don't realize that they go, oh well, they're rich, they deserve it, they should be able to do what they want with their money. Uh, you know, just like you said, they weren't born into a blank space. They were born; they're standing on the shoulders of giants. Exactly, exactly. As it, it, so when and and because of our system, the way it's been so rigged in the powerful people's favor, meaning the people with money, the way it's been so rigged is that someone like Jeff Bezos can now be the richest person in the history of the world, including pharaohs. Yeah. And at the same time, the people generating that income for him are on food stamps. Yeah. And what kind of person does that? A megalomaniac psychopath. Yep. And people don't realize that Jeff Bezos is a psychopath, yet he's in. he owns the Washington Post, yeah. he's in the bed with CIA to the tune of $600 million, and he also sits on the board of the Pentagon. They're the richest man in the world who literally looks like Dr. Evil, <laughs> owns the newspaper of note, is in bed with the deep state yeah. intelligence community, has all your information stored, because we live under surveillance state, that's why the CIA contracts contracted him to store your information and then he sits on a pentagon board and we're living in an endless war we are living in an orwellian nightmare of perpetual war yeah. right now right now we're spending 40 percent more on our military than we were at the height of the afghanistan and iraq war 40 percent more and we never had a meeting about that mm -hmm. there was never a town hall there were no op-eds they just spent that money and you make the point in the in the book that it's because rich countries can spend as much as they want. Why is that? If, you, uh, if you're an empire, which the U.S. is the cliche empire, but China's an empire and Russia's an empire, you have so much dominance in the way that, the way that things unfold that when you take loans from other countries like the United States does as a debtor nation, it's not expected that they're ever going to pay this stuff back as long as the U.S. dollar is strong. Now, you saw Iran recently took the euro away as it's, excuse me, they applied the euro as opposed to the dollar for, petro, for, for petrol trade mm -hmm. and other things. Uh, that's a good sign in terms of deflating the power of the U.S. dollar, not necessarily for us because it's all systemically related, but in terms of, you know, the broader kind of moral view. Uh, so the United States, it's been estimated in across the world that by 2040, 60 to 70 percent of all nations will be bankrupt by their own metrics. The United States isn't susceptible to that because it just makes its own money. Yes. It has this arrangement with the central bank, which is just a fraudulent show of what's it called? A, a, a sleight of hand. Yes. It's a sleight of hand between this big banking cartel that makes money out of nothing in exchange for bonds that we make out of nothing in the treasury. And so suddenly all this fake debt is made between literally just a car. It's just one big group of, of people that don't really care. The, the Federal Reserve doesn't care if the United States pays its money back. It just needs its cartel to be respected and the power of the financial class and the financial system 
uh, to to be as strong as it ever has been, which is why you see Goldman Sachs sitting next to the president across every administration. <laughs> yes. So, 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 so can I, let me stop for a second. Yeah, sure. So let me explain what you're saying. So a poor nation goes to the IMF, gets a loan. Now, they're immediately in debt. Now, they can't pay that debt back. The IMF goes back to that country and says, now you have to sell off some of your public space to our corporation so you can pay your debt because you're in debt. Now, the United States is in debt to the turn of $19 trillion right now. We're never going to pay that back. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter because, as you say in the book, uh, money is made out of thin air and they only care about regulations and the public perception. Yeah. Right. And that uh, any dominant country, meaning the United States, can extend debt to infinity, moving the goalposts as they go along. Yeah. And by 2050, you say 60 percent of the world's countries will be bankrupt, but we'll never be bankrupt no. No, it's just because a- we print our own money. Well, other countries do that too, mind you. But the difference is those countries aren't empires. They don't have the strength, the 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 uh, the transnational. Cor- there's eighty percent of all the major transnational corporations are U.S. based. So all really? those huge companies. I mean, they don't really care about nations anymore, as you imagine. The trade agreements, the there TPP. There are no nations. But They're only corporations. But there's still some grounding to U.S. policy and, and U.S. favoritism, and of course U.S. political power, because U.S. political power is really global political power. So the nest of the U.S. empire is alive and well when it comes to the merger of politics, geopolitics, and of course business trade agreements and all of that stuff. That's why the U.S. is so untouchable, and it could the, the joke, you know, every couple of years, oh. We're going to shut down the government because we have to increase the debt limit. You know, it's such a fucking, it's a complete comic routine. You know, it's like, what are they going to do, not do it? So, yeah, so that's the point there. But other countries, just like the poor of the world that suffer with debt, they do get screwed. So they're the ones that get their resources taken through austerity and through different trade agreements. Remember, the IMF and the World Bank are basically Western institutions. They are an extension of Western hegemony. Their interest is, is the neoliberal interest. Which goes back again to to a think tank years ago in the 70s that was trying to counter communism that said we need something to counter communism to start to end any kind of socialist ideology across the world. So neoliberal, liberal, neoliberalism is our new philosophy and we're going to put it out there like a religion. And that's what all these institutions do, which is why you can't have any country such as... Uh, Oh, I don't know, almost all the Latin American countries that have been overthrown as they tried to do something different throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. One thing I, I recently did a talk of uh, was a man named Salvador Allende from Chile. Salvador Allende was, was democratically elected. He was a uh, stern, not a Marxist in the traditional sense. He didn't like the bureaucracy of the Soviet Union. He wasn't supported by the Soviet Union. But in Chile, he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to turn this around. He was so sick of the U.S. transnational corporations taking all the resources, owning all the land, U.S.-based, as they did. I'm sure you know people like John Perkins. He talked about a lot of this stuff. And so he said, I'm going to nationalize these industries, and I'm going to set up a new a new system of economic organization. Now, this is an important tidbit of history um, in terms of the kind of uh, solutions I talk about at the end of this book. In the 1970s, a man named Stafford Beer, he was really famous in systems engineering, all about how to make systems work, be viable, as he would call it. What does it mean to have a working engine that's self-contained? What does it mean to have a working economy? What does it mean to have a working social system? How do, how do we approach that subject scientifically? And this is what the work of cybernetics, Stafford Beer, Ross, Ross Aspie, all these guys that no one's ever heard of, but actually very important in is history. Is this called systems theory? You call it that, but it's okay. um, it, they call it cybernetics this, for many okay. years. It's, it's basically it's an interdisciplinary view of how uh, things work in both science and humanities. It's very deep. Yes. And but it also relates to sociology and social uh, social constructs, as we would imagine. As you know, these are systems. They have properties. Systems have properties that are shared throughout the universe, in fact. Uh, no metaphysics needed there. There's certain things that that are inherent to your body that can be emulated in the way we organize society. Biomimicry, but I won't, you know, go too far down that road. But anyway, in the nineteen seventies, he was called up by Allende, who said, I want you to develop a new system for my country to figure out how we can organize and optimize our economic flows with my new nationalized industries. Because the, com- you know, the companies just bailed, and, and, and Allende was considered the enemy of the world at this point, because you don't do that in capitalist society. You don't, you, don't, you don't knock out your corporations and start nationalizing. Because then they're going to call the Marines. <laughs> yeah, exactly, which is what they did, because he was overthrown and he died in the overthrow. But before he died, for two years, he had this amazing project called Project Cybersyn. Cybersyn. 
So cyber and then S-Y-N. People can look this up. It's a tidbit of history. It's been propagandized. They put a big thing in the New York Times. Chile, now run by socialist computer. No. What they did is they tried to figure out how to take into account all the dynamics and variability of a robust excuse me, national economy and figure out how to organize it as a unit, not in the bureaucracy of the Soviet Union. These guys hated that. And they hated it. Stafford Beer, the organizer of this, hated it because it was just this big, horrible bureaucracy. It was extremely inefficient and didn't have real-time information. It didn't work, as we've come to find out in the way that it needed to. You mean to. the communist system? The communist system as we've known it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was the only attempt in, 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 in history where the actual scientific approach, things that I advocate in this book, was applied, and it almost, almost got into fruition if Allende wasn't overthrown by the CIA. I mean, I, it's one of those moments in history. There's actually a guy that wrote a whole book about it. It's in Spanish. He wrote a book, sci-fi book, to, to describe what happened if it if actually that worked. Have worked. Yeah, I want to read it. So this is but, so. So you're saying in, uh, that he, in Chile he was trying to institute what you are prescribing as the fix to our current system. An interdisciplinary approach to economic management that's democratized. And we have the technology to do that. Back then, they used telex machines. They had one computer. They had to engage very crudely you know, with all the people that were organizing different areas of industry. It's a big thing. I won't go into the details of it. But what I advocate is that we have all this amazing technology. We have the ability to communicate instantly. We have the ability to track what we're doing to, say, be sustainable. Imagine that. Imagine if the industries of our world actually cared about tracking, say, rainforest depletion or biodiversity loss. And then they stopped their behavior based upon those limits when they're reached. We don't do that. We don't have any contingency plan, which is why we're, again, flying off that cliff on this train. So... It, and we could talk about, you know, the five things. Remember I talk about five different transitions at the end of the book, the application of automation, the move from property to access, which we're already seeing trends of that occur with, say, Uber and so on. People don't need to own one of everything. They need access to what they need. It creates a more communal environment. So you're talking about, like, that's like when you see uh, zip cars, things yeah, like that? exactly. But, but more specific, you know, like, I envision in the uh, deep future where people don't really own anything. They have access to what they need at all times. doesn't mean they don't have things. doesn't mean you don't have a laptop in your computer or whatever your property may be that you use frequently. But imagine the freedom of being able to get up, fly somewhere, and have access to the resources that you may need, whether it be clothes or technology, a place to stay, all systemically designed and interactive and updated and dynamic. Not, you know, I'm not talking about a static thing. I know it sounds very sci-fi when I talk about this this way. But imagine that kind of freedom. I see freedom as no property. I see freedom as being, uh, being a part of this home, this planetary home, and moving around freely and having access to what you need as you go along. Our next live Jimmy Dore show is July 1st in Portland, Oregon. There's a link for tickets for all of our live shows right there. And if you can remember, please take a moment to make sure you're subscribed to the show. It only takes a second. You probably think you're subscribed, but you probably aren't. Just make sure you're subscribed. Click that bell so they send you a notice when we drop a video. Otherwise, they won't tell you. And if you become a premium member or a Patreon, we give you hours of bonus material every week. And we do a live chat every Saturday at 2 p.m. Pacific time where you can ask us questions and we'll answer them. Plus, we're on Steam It. We're steaming it right now.